Okay, everyone, welcome back to Premier Study Investing. Today, I'm going to be reading an article from Fortune magazine. It's famed economist Robert Schiller has a new metric to value the stock market. Here's what it's saying. This is a little bit more technical, so I am going to try to put this on the screen so you can pause and read it. But let me try to just give you an idea of where we're going. Many of you know the P.E. ratio. It's a common metric used to look at stocks, evaluate them. It's the price on the top, what you're going to have to pay for a dollar of earnings on the bottom. So imagine earnings are on the bottom and prices on the top. Now, Robert Schiller, he came out of Yale that we'll find out, and he basically adjusted this to smooth it out over a longer period of time. Basically what he did, you could think of the PE being very volatile. Maybe, um, you know, we had a pretty significant 2020, a pretty turbulent 2020. And you can imagine that the prices jumped up and down a lot. We knew that happened in March. And maybe if earnings were the same, well, the PE ratio would really shift a lot during the course of a year. So what Robert did, he basically smoothed it over a 10 year period. And what this is often called is the, the CAPE, the C-A-P-E, cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio. So he, this is kind of his claim to fame. Okay, so this is something, if you've never heard about it, now you know about it. This new thing, they're going to call it the excess CAPE ratio. And what it basically does is it takes the CAPE and it inverts it, right? So now price is on the bottom and earnings is on the top. So it's basically telling you, if, if you had, um, it's basically telling you how many earning, how much earnings am I getting for every dollar that I pay is the way to think of it. So let's just do a quick example before we start. Let's say the PE of the S&P 500 is 25. I'm not sure if that's right, but it's a nice example for what we're going to do. If it was 25, it's 25 over 1, right? If we invert that, 1 over 25 would be like 0 0.04. Um, we could say 0 0.04 over 1 would be another way to say it, which would mean I would get 4 cents of earnings exposure for every dollar that I'm forced to pay in order to buy my stock. Okay? Are you with me so far? I think you are. This will help. Basically, we're going to be looking at the excess cape. And ultimately, this writer says it's not a very good measure. Let's go. Robert Schiller is rightly revered for developing what's arguably the gold standard for gauging if stocks are cheap, pricey, or somewhere in between. The Yale University's Economist's celebrated measure is the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio, or what is often called the CAPE. The CAPE eliminates the distortion caused by big swings in profits that can make PEs at any moment look artificially inflated or depressed. Think right now how PEs appear outrageously high simply because of the Rona, which has temporarily crushed earnings that are sure to rebound. Schiller smooths those peaks and valleys by averaging S&P 500 profits over the trailing 10 years. He then adjusts that stream for inflation. His numerator, the P, or price, is simply the current reading for S&P 500 index. The E in the denominator is that adjusted figure for earnings per share. The CAPE has no peers as a predictor of where big cap shares are headed, and right now it's flashing bright red. The current reading, based on the S&P's record close of 3,853 on January 21st, is 35.13. Ooh, so a lot higher than what I said. So 35.13 was the PE on January 21st. It's only been that high one period over the 140 years in the run-up to the tech bubble that burst in 2000, sending the S&P 500 down 44%. In the months before the 1929 meltdown, the Cape peaked at 33 and stood at 27 prior to the collapse in the great financial crisis. Usually, the Cape ascends to its highest points where the economy is great. It's especially worrisome this time that valuations keep planting the flag at higher and higher peaks when the economy is struggling to regain its output at the end of 2019, and according to the CBO's projection, won't get there until 2022. The cape of 35 plus seems so high that even the bulls would strain to portray that equities as a bargain. But Schiller recently introduced a new yardstick that give the optimists a fresh narrative, and they're mining it with relish. It's called the excess cape yield. The formula takes the inverse of the CAPE, which is really Schiller's earnings yield. His measure of the profits of the S&P is delivered for each dollar investors are paying. He then subtracts the real or inflation adjusted yield on the 10 year treasury. That number represents the margin that stocks are paying over bonds. So this is great because now we're going to be able to compare stocks with bonds using this excess CAPE yield. So he says, what puts the gloss on the excess CAPE yield and hence on equities is that the real yield on treasuries is now famously negative, an extremely rare occurrence. Remember, they're talking about 
the real yield. So you have your nominal yield that you're going to get from your bond, and then you have to subtract inflation just for those who aren't, you know, deep into this, uh, maybe new to investing, okay? So say maybe I get a 1% yield on my bond, and I have to subtract off 1.5% for inflation. That means my real yield is going to be in the negative territory, right? It's actually going to be negative 0.5%. Okay, just to keep keep us all straight. So they say an extremely rare occurrence to have real negative yields. They say as of January 21st, the regular CAPE yield was a paltry 2.85%, which is basically just the inverse of the CAPE at 35.13. So one over 35.13 would give you that 2.85%. That looks pretty bad, but Schiller puts inflation at 1.68, which is 0.56% higher than the long bond rate of 1.12%. So the real yield on the 10 year is a negative 0.56. The excess CAPE stands at 3.41. They're calculating that basically the difference between the regular CAPE yield that's going to give you the positive 2.85 minus the negative 0.56 that you're going to get on the long bond. Okay, a difference of 3.41%. Now, they tell us what that means. That means stocks, which are extremely pricey, still beat bonds by a wide margin, mainly because bonds are offering lousy, less than zero returns far into the future. So we continue, but does the excess CAPE really have anything like the predictive power of the regular CAPE? It's true that in previous periods, investors have done fairly well when buying in at an excess CAPE of about 3.5%, which is basically where we are today. We're at 3.41. So they basically back calculated this because he just put this out recently. They basically went and looked at it. They calculated it historically. And they said, what happens when people buy when the excess cape is at about 3.5% where we are today? And here's what they found. It stood at that level in June of 2008 and August of 1988. And shareholders got an 8.2% and a 14.5% real annual return over the next decade. But the evidence is muddled. Those who purchased at the 3.5% mark, again, where we are today, at different times, for example, October 1973, lost 2% over the next decade. And buyers in October of 1971 barely broke even over the next decade. Folks reaped mediocre gains by buying when the CAPE excess was at 3.5% in the 1950s and also the 1960s. So what they're telling us is that it's not really a surefire way to gauge how things are gonna go. They continue, it's also significant that in recent months, the excess CAPE has been pointing to lower and lower future returns. It's dropped steadily from 4.88% in March of last year to today's 3.41% as the S&P has soared and it's also been hit more recently by the spike in the long bond as fixed income pays more, equities edge as measured by the CAPE shrinks. Yes, yeah, so you're looking for that gap. You're looking for that gap between bond yields and uh, equities in, as measured in the S&P 500. The argument for using the original CAPE and ignoring the newcomer, the, the excess CAPE, is threefold. Here's the first reason they give us. First, the excess CAPE is really signaling that stocks are extremely expensive and bonds are even more outrageously overpriced, so much so that they won't even keep pace with inflation. Quote, saying that stocks are pricey and bonds are worse is not a reason to go out and buy stocks, says Rob Arnott, chief of research affiliates, a firm that oversees investment strategies for ETFs and mutual funds. Point number two, why it's not very good. Second, the excess CAPE is even higher for European and Japanese stocks than for the S&P 500. Ooh, well, that would be, that might be good. Let's see what they say. And that's because they're both much cheaper. The Schiller PE is a lot higher. And their real rates are even lower. That's an argument for buying Japanese and European stocks instead of equities, says or not. If that measure really moves markets, those two will way outperform the US. It's also been that way for a long time, yet Japanese and European shares have proven poor performers despite their elevated excess capes. Okay, so doesn't seem to be true on that point. They appear to look kind of backward looking over some time and say, ah, uh, the excess cape tells us that these equities in Japan and Europe should be really doing great, and they haven't been. Third point. 
Third, there's nothing normal about negative real rates, and little reason to think they'll of years. Let's look at a scenario where rates revert to the mean, or go even higher. Say the real yield on long bond rises to 3%. Hmm, okay. It's about one point something, and they're saying if it goes up to 3, okay. Oh, the real yield. No, no, the real yield is at um, negative 0.56. So they say, what if it goes up to a real return of 3% on bonds and regular CAPE yield waxes to 6%? That means bonds would drop 40% and stock fall by 50% because the CAPE would drop from 35 times to 16.6 times, where it's been many times before. Then the excess CAPE would still be 3% just below where it is now. Yes, we're at 3.41. It would still be at 3%. We'd have the same excess CAPE as we do right now. They said that the 6% regular CAPE yield minus the 3% real yield on the long bond. That's right. That's a 3% difference. 6% regular CAPE minus the 3% real yield on the long bonds would put us exactly where we are today. But very, very different, obviously, uh, equities, prices, and very, very different uh, bond prices. In other words, the excess CAPE barely changed, but stocks lost half their value. It's sending the same prediction now as when stocks were twice as pricey. So how's that for a forecast? The excess CAPE would have misled us while the regular CAPE was right in displaying the real quote-unquote CAPE fear. Smart investors should stick to the original. That's the end of the article. I'll link it and wish you guys the best. Thanks so much. Bye.